heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Three Angels Broadcasting Network and the South England Conference present London 2016. Once again, we welcome you all tonight and for your faithfulness in coming out to the meetings and just allowing God to speak to our hearts and to reveal a message that we need to hear. We continue throughout this weekend as we hear more Bible-based Christ-centered messages. And I know that as we go through this weekend, we're going to truly be inspired from the Word of God. We've been having listeners and those who have been watching around the world, and I'd like to just mention someone who has written in and who sends greetings. His name is Peter and Iris Fanstone. They've been watching every night. They're from the Cotswolds in the West Country of England. And they have said that we've uh, watched all the programs up to now, and we have been blessed with the messages. God, uh, it is good to hear the gospel being preached and people coming to Jesus Christ. So if you're listening and you're listening from various parts of the world, then we invite you to, to send a few words of welcome and greeting to us, and we'll be happy to read them out and to mention where you're from. Tonight's topic is, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? And uh, so let us allow the Spirit of God to truly open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to that message this evening. But before our speaker, Pastor John Lomacan, comes, we are happy to have with us uh, for the first time and tonight, Reggie and Lady Love, we welcome you this evening and may you bless us as we prepare for the Word of God. And for that moment, he was 
Wow, so glad to have Reggie and Lady Love with us. Uh, they are very much a part of our three ABN family. We enjoy praising God together, traveling together, singing to the glory of God together. And anytime they sing that song, I'm suspended somewhere between heaven and earth. It's a fitting song because believe, between heaven and earth, is a constant connection with humanity between prayer, somewhere between heaven and earth. And I, I thought of a very interesting topic entitled, Can You Hear Me Now?, which in fact, if you spent any time in the United States at all, it used to be a slogan used by one of the telephone companies. Whenever they had difficulty getting through, they would shake up the phone and say, Can you hear me now? But tonight we're going to consider the importance of prayer in the life of the Christian, how that unbroken thread between heaven and earth is very imperative and necessary for our growth and for our success as Christians. So tonight, bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, this is your opportunity to connect between heaven and earth. We pray that we open our ears and hearts to hear what the Spirit says to the church, in Jesus' name, amen. September 11th was a turning point in the world. My wife and I happened to be in London on that day. She was born in Derby. We were here visiting her family members that are dispersed throughout either the city or Palmer's Green or here in London or in Derbyshire. And I decided, I said, honey, when do you want to go back home? She said, let's go back home on September 11th. And that was 2001. We entered the plane with one kind of a world. We exited the plane with a completely different world altogether. This title is, an, is synonymous or very instrumental in what happened that day because my wife was a Sprint phone customer. She had a Sprint phone. I had a Verizon phone. And our experience in California at the time was I would have much more service coverage than she did. And so when we were rerouted to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, I was so anxious. I could not wait when I heard the terrible news in New York City about the World Trade Center in Washington, D.C. 
my mind was instantly transported to the fact that my sister worked for the fire department. And in such an emergency, she would be at the World Trade Center. Well, I said to my wife, I cannot wait to land so that I can call my sister. And I jokingly reminded her about the fact that, well, her phone never gets any signal anyhow, so she could use my phone when we get to Canada. Well, the plane landed. We were one of the first ones to land in Canada on United Airlines 955, far from the terminal. I turned on my phone. She turned on her phone. I could not get a signal. My wife turned on her phone, and she got a tremendous signal. And she turned to me and said, can you hear me now? <laughs> and I learned in a very quick way that, uh, as one says, those who laugh last laugh best. But something tragic happened in New York because I couldn't get through. Communication was down. The towers of the World Trade Center that furnished phone signal for much of Manhattan was down. I could not get through at all. And I thought to myself, what would happen if communication between earth and heaven were severed for 24 hours? What would happen on this planet if heaven went dark for 24 to 48 hours, we could not get a prayer through. I would suggest to you that it would be far worse than September 11th. But I'm so glad to know tonight that we can call heaven anytime, any day. Come on, somebody, say amen. We don't get a phone call. I mean, we don't get a bill. We don't get a busy signal. The Lord does not put us on hold. There is an unbroken line between heaven and earth 24 hours a day. Can the church say amen? amen? That's why Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8 is so instrumental. The Bible says, let's read this together. Are you ready? Here we go. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For how many? Everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks what else? Finds. And to him who knocks it what? It will, not might, it will be open. Hallelujah to that. God promises to answer the prayers of everyone whose heart is turned towards him in sincerity. So what can be more powerful and transforming than talking to God and knowing that he hears us? What can be more life-changing than knowing that our prayers are the joy of the Lord and that the prayers of our hearts are received and responded to from heaven? The answer is nothing more than joy and power in our hearts. Throughout our lives as husband and wife, there have been so many instances where we have knelt on our knees and prayed. And had we not known that God was there, we know that our prayer life will be an exercise of futility. But it was also always so good to know that whenever we got on our knees and prayed to our Heavenly Father, He was there waiting. He was there with open arms and open ears, listening to the voice of His children. But tonight I'm going to begin with a very unusual statement. I want you to listen very carefully. You see, in spite of all the ways that our prayers have been answered, I don't believe in prayer. I don't believe that prayer works. I don't believe in prayer, and I don't believe that prayer works. I believe in God, and I believe that God works. You can breathe. <laughs> it is not belief in prayer that makes a difference. It is belief in God that makes a difference. I mean, why call someone whom you don't believe is there? Why pick up your cell phone? Why pick up your home phone? Why send a message either by text or by email to someone you really are not convinced is really there? That's why the only thing worse than praying is praying to a God that you really don't actually believe exists. I remember the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. He gave those who worshiped a false god, he gave them all day long to pray to their god, their idols. 400 prophets of Baal, 450 apostatized prophets of Israel. All day long they beseeched their god. 
They whipped themselves. They danced. They shouted. They yelled. And then Elijah said, pray a little louder. Maybe he's resting somewhere. Maybe he's on a long journey and maybe he's not back yet. Just continue praying. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. They prayed to brass. They prayed to wood. They prayed to stone. Whenever you pray to anything and anybody but God, you're praying to brass and wood and stone. Amen, somebody. I don't want to belittle anyone, but I want to just say, as I preface this statement, that 99% of my family is Catholic. And whenever I go home to the Virgin Islands, I try to find some ways to communicate the beauty of praying to a living God, not to a dead Mary. And I say that with utmost respect because I believe that God does accept the sincerity of those who don't know better. But when you talk to Jesus, because the Bible says there's only one man between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. No man comes to the Father except how? Through me. That's why belief in an existing God makes a difference. We had a chance yesterday. My wife and I walked 8.2 miles yesterday, which means I would rather be sitting down preaching tonight <laughs> than standing up. When we got back to the hotel last night, she said, Honey, I don't know, but my legs are tired. I didn't understand what she meant until we went out again today and took a short walk. And I said, Honey, you're right, my legs are tired. But, we, but in our journey, we stopped at a, one of the local churches, and we heard people reciting their prayers. We saw someone stand in front of the statue of Peter and hold on to his foot and pray to Peter. And I said, that's, that's bronze. That's brass. He doesn't hear you. Then I heard the Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now and at the hour of their death. And I said, Lord Jesus, please find a way to get to the hearts of these sincere people. They know no other way. You see, the Lord finds us where we are, but praise God, He never leaves us where He finds us. Amen. Believing in a living God is imperative to getting our prayers through. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, notice what the Bible says. It says, but without faith, without what? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Why? For he who comes to God must believe that what? He is and that he is a rewarder of those who, what, yeah. diligently seek him. Don't seek God as though he's busy or doesn't have time for you. That's why when people say to me, well, I can't really help you. All I can do is pray. If all you can do is talk to my almighty heavenly father, amen to that. Because I know nobody else that I would rather you talk to about my situation than God. You may talk to people that don't have the finances to help me or don't have the time to help me. But the Bible says he is, he is our ever-present help in what? In time of need. God is never too busy for his children. But why pray if you doubt that God exists? If you doubt that God exists, you need to inquire where there is no doubt. Listen to the words of David the psalmist in Psalms 19, verse 1 to 3. Psalms 19, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, this is where there is no doubt. The Bible says, the heavens declare the what? The glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. If you doubt, let the heavens talk to you. And night unto night revealed knowledge. And I love verse 3. There is what? No speech nor language where their voice is not heard. My wife and I, when we lived in Northern California in the mountains, far away from the cities, I never forgot one evening as we were traveling from one town back to our town, and we climbed through the mountains. These mountains had no guardrails. 6,000 feet. If you made the wrong turn... Hope you had everything right between you and Jesus. But we cautiously pulled off the side of the road, got out of our vehicle, parked it, and we climbed on the hood of our SUV and leaned back on the windshield and just laid there in the dark of night and waited for a few minutes to pass by. And all of a sudden, sister, the heavens started talking to us. We saw God's handiwork. Our eyes began to adjust to the darkness of the night. 
And the beauty of the heavens, this verse began to, to jump out. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The same stars seen by Adam and Eve, the same stars seen by Elijah and Noah and Abraham, the same stars that guided the wise men to the place where Jesus was born, the same stars that ignited the night when the shepherds waited for the good news of the birth of our Savior. Somebody ought to say amen. These same stars set in place by God charts the course of humanity and lets us know when we doubt to take the moment and look up to the heavens and say, convince me that God exists. You cannot tell me that somebody coincidentally or accidentally or any kind of evolutionary explosion could do something so wonderfully. That's why the oldest book in the Bible reveals a conversation between God and Job. This detailed account answers the questions to those that doubt. Job chapter 38 verse 4 and 5. Listen to the conversation. Very profound scripture. It's laying the foundation for something I read that is going to really open your mind tonight to help you understand the beauty of the power of prayer. After Job complained about his circumstances, never blaming God, but looking at the adversity of his circumstances, God stepped forward and said to Job, it's my turn. And God said to him, in verse 4 and 5. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, can you imagine God backing you up? God said, Job, wait, it's my turn now. Tell me where you were when I laid the foundations of the earth. Tell me if you know so much. Tell me who determined its measurements. Surely you know. I mean, you're Job, big and bad Job, the man with a lot of possessions, Job. Tell me, you know so much, where were you? Who stretched the lines upon it? And these questions laid the foundation and became the focus of a research that blew my mind away. I share this with you now. In this, re in this research, these questions were answered. An article entitled, Reasons to Believe in the Existence of God and His Word. A lady outlined a number of reasons why she believes in the existence of God and the, and the veracity and the authenticity of His Word. Listen to the first reason. She said, the complexity of our planets and its points. She said, the complexity of our planet is connected to a deliberate designer who not only created our universe, but also sustains it. What do you say? There's no, when you look at the heavens at night, my wife and I, we gauge often where we are. We look up at the things that we understand. We look at the Milky Way, the Big Dipper, Orion, and depending on the time of the year, whenever we are in Australia and we feel homesick, we say, honey, there's the Big Dipper right out front of our house when we get back to Thompsonville. That's the same Big Dipper. And when we're here in London, if we see the Milky Way, we say, that's the same Milky Way we see in Thompsonville. And it hasn't moved. It hasn't moved a fraction. It's still used to guide and become a compass and a reliable one at that. She also pointed out the earth in its size. She said the earth is perfect in its size. This research scientist says, and I quote, the Earth's size and corresponding gravity holds a thin layer of mostly nitrogen and oxygen gases, only extending about 50 miles above the Earth's surface. And she says, if Earth was smaller like the planet Mercury, an atmosphere would be impossible. If Earth was larger like Jupiter, its atmosphere would contain free hydrogen. And then she concluded, Earth is the only known planet equipped with an atmosphere of the right mixture of gases to sustain plant, animal, and human life. And she ended by saying, where did it come from? Well, let me continue. Fascinating article. The other reason she gave was water. She says, water is a necessity. Water is colorless, odorless, and without taste. And yet no living thing can survive without it. Do you know that to be a fact? You ever get thirsty? Soda can't quench your thirst. Ginger beer can't quench your thirst. Moby can't quench your thirst. No matter what West Indian drink you have, nothing can quench our thirst like water. Amen? Because that's God's design. She continues. She says, plants, animals, 
and human beings consist mostly of water. About two-thirds of the human body is water. But then she breaks it down. She says water is a temperature regulator. Water allows us to live in an environment of fluctuating temperature changes while keeping our bodies at a steady 98.6 degrees. That's what water does. That's why we need water. She also says water is a universal solvent. This property of water means that these various chemicals, minerals, and uh, nutrients can be carried throughout our bodies into the smallest blood vessels by something as simple as water. We need water for the nutrients to penetrate our blood vessels. Without water, our blood will become sticky and, and, and hard to move, almost somehow coagulated. We need water every day for our bodies to function. And she says, amazingly enough, this colorless, odorless combination of chemicals has the perfect chemistry compound to furnish our vessels with the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs. She also says, water has a unique surface tension. This was an amazing thing. She says, water in plants can therefore flow upward against gravity. Nothing else flows upward against gravity but water, furnishing nourishment to the tallest trees on the earth. And then she says, water is transformative. 97% of the earth's surface is water. But on our earth, there is a system design which removes salt from the water and then distributes that water throughout the globe. It is called evaporation. She says, somehow, somebody put in place a system that causes salt water to evaporate and cause fresh water from the salt water to fall upon the earth, the planet, and the streams. She says, who could possibly put something of such complexity in place? But then she says the human brain. The human brain simultaneously processes an amazing amount of information. And then she says the human brain processes more than a million messages a second. Somebody ought to say amen to that. A million messages, but even more than that. She says the brain weighs the importance of the data and filters out those things that the brain considers relatively, relatively unimportant. So you might see something as you walk through Harrods or you're on the bus, or you're on the eye, or you're walking through London, or you're on your way to work, and you just glance it, and five years down the road, you remember what you saw, because the brain, with the help of the eye, captured that and held it. Matter of fact, I need to say, there are things I've seen when I was a child that I still remember today. Because the brain put it where I could not forget it, but there are also some things I saw I've, I wish I've never seen. Because the brain stores it until something activates that thought. Then she went on a little deeper. She says, the human eye distinguishes among seven, millions co seven million colors. The eye has automatic focusing and handles an astounding 1.5 million messages simultaneously per second. And the reason why she's listing these things is because she entered into a research project trying to figure out how is that possible. Then she pointed to our universe, quoting astrophysicist Robert Jastrow, who says, the seed of everything that has happened in the universe was planted in that first instant. Every star, every planet, and every living creature in the universe came into being as the result of events that were set in motion in the moment of this cosmic explosion. And then he says, the universe flashed into being, and we cannot find out what caused that to happen. I can tell you what. He spake and it was done. Somebody say amen. He commanded and it what? It stood fast. She also says, the Nobel Peace Prize winner by Richard Fenneman, he says, Speaking about the universe, she says, the universe, he says, the universe is mathematical. And as this physicist tries to figure out where the mathematics came from, he says, there is a fact that everything in our universe, everything in our solar system works on a mathematical basis. And he says, how is that possible unless somebody put these mathematical formulas in place and continues to keep them mathematically true? 
But what's even more amazing than the findings is the foreword about the author. Listen very carefully. Marilyn Adamson wrote this article and she says, based on what I've shared with you, just a portion of her article, she says, I was an atheist at one time. And like many atheists, the issue of people believing in God bothered me greatly. She says, what is it about atheists that we should spend so much time, attention, and energy refuting something that we don't really believe exists? But, but even more than that, the thing that set her in motion was this. She said, I found it difficult to refute the continuously answered prayers of a good friend of mine. It was the answered prayers in the life of her friend that caused her to begin to research how can these prayers get answered if there was not somebody existing that would answer those prayers. So it catapulted her into a one-year research, and at the end of that one year, she says these words. She says, I've responded to the God who, offers, who offered to came into my life, and I have found faith in him to be the constant sustaining grace and the one that continues to reward me. This former atheist, through prayer, found God. Can you say amen? amen? Marilyn did what God invites every one of us to do. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. This is what she did. The Bible says, and you will together, and you will what? Seek me, and you will what? Find me when you do what? Search for me with how much? All your heart. When you pray, you got to pray like somebody's there. I see young people sometimes in church, they can't even put their phone down. You know why? Because somebody's on the other end. In our bulletin in our church, we say, please turn off your cell phone. Some people listen to it, some people don't. But you might know friends that are just continually texting. They say children today are getting carpal tunnel syndrome at an earlier age because they are continually communicating. Can you imagine what would happen? Can you imagine what would happen if, if all of a sudden tomorrow all cell service was discontinued in London for the next 10 years? There would be a pandemic of a crisis among the young people. They wouldn't know what to do with their time. Can you imagine if the internet was disconnected from now on in London? If there was some kind of an electronic pulse that knocked out all possibility of communicating for the next 10 years, what would young people do? You know what they'll do? They'll discover God. <laughs> My niece, who left the Virgin Islands and went on a journey somewhere, when she left, she left her phone in the Virgin Islands, and I, I couldn't help, and I, I tried to get in touch with her, and my brother said, well, she doesn't have a phone, it's here. She, she lived in that phone. Could you pass me that phone right there real quickly? Just throw it, I promise not to drop it. <laughs> a phone that's falling apart hopefully belongs to a person who isn't. Somebody once said, if you wanna know, if you, if you wanna know how important the phone is, they said, all you've got to do is turn your phone off to discover who's really important. <laughs> if you look in the phone when it's off, you'll find out who really is important, you. When your phone is on, it takes you out of the picture. Don't drop it. She put on Facebook, she said, I never thought that I could live without my phone, but I can honestly say at 22 years old, I don't need my phone. Come on, amen, young people. I don't need my phone. Young people say, I'm bored. Don't have nothing to do. I had two young people sitting on my couch in my office at church, sitting right next to each other. And I overheard one of them say, did you get that? And I looked up. I thought they were talking to me. But they were talking to each other. And then she said, no, I didn't get that. She said, you didn't get that? And I said, get what? I had to break into the, get what? She said, I just sent her a text. I said, turn around and talk to her. <laughs> Put the phone down. Nowadays, when you send your child to their room and say, you are grounded for one week, they are happy. <laughs> I got my phone, I got my internet. Got my laptop, ground me for two weeks, I'll be glad. Because they don't want to talk to you anyhow. 
They want to talk to their friends. Am I telling the truth? That's why I like the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We ought to find joy in talking to our God, seeking God. As this text said, seeking God is one of the most urgent instructions in the Bible that has been interrupted by modern society. We were in uh, Trafalgar Square. We also went down to um, right in that area where you see all the, all the big bright signs. What do they call that? Piccadilly Circus. When you're down there, your mind is challenged to think about God. When you're in Times Square in New York City, there's so much media coming at you from so many different directions. To think about God is a great, tremendous exercise because our minds are being bombarded. That's why the Lord says, when you pray, go into your closet. Shut the world down. Talk to me. And the God that you talk to in secret will reward you openly. Isaiah 55, verse 6, is the prayer that this generation needs. Together, seek the Lord while he what? May be found. Call upon him while he is what? Near. But then this also comes with an instruction that is also a caveat to God blessing us when we pray. Verse 57, or verse 7 of Isaiah 55. Let the wicked do what? Forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his what? Thoughts. Let him do what? Return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will what? Abundantly pardon. You know, some people think that prayer is powerful. Prayer is not powerful. God is powerful. I've seen people in Northern California pray to trees. They pray to rocks. My wife and I were recently, oh, we were in Colorado, or where was it? In Arizona, somewhere. We were, in Arizona, we were going to the Grand Canyon. We stopped in a small, quaint town, oh, about 35, about 5,000 feet on our way above sea level. Beautiful little town. And I quickly noticed, because I studied the occult, I said, honey, this town is replete with witchcraft. I can see it everywhere. So we went into a store with the prayer crystals, the prayer rocks, the purple rocks, the red rocks all these prayer icons, and they had numerous books on prayer. They even had a book called The Second Coming of Jesus. And I thought, oh, praise the Lord, there's some Christian material until I looked a little closer. The Second Coming of Jesus is a conscious internal reality to those who pray to some unusual God. They use the name, the second coming of Jesus. But everything in this store was designed to lead you into a direction of prayer that will bring you to the same place that all those false prophets on Mount Carmel got to, praying to idols with eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, hands that cannot touch. They cannot lift your burdens. Only God can reach down and touch and inhabit the lives of his children when we pray to a living God. 1 John 3 and verse 22, the Lord has conditions to answer prayers. He says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive from him. But that's not where the text ends. Because we what? Keep his commandments. And what else? Do those things that are what? Pleasing in his sight. Can you imagine your child, your unruly, disobedient child, coming to you with an attitude and say, give me the car keys. I need to go out. And you just fork them over. Would you do that? Now, if you West Indian, you won't. I won't tell you what you will do, because I don't want to promote child abuse. But I was raised in a home where well, I tell you, put it this way, I learned how to sit and stand. And I learned what else my bottom is used for. But unruly children will come and say to the man, give me this, give me that. I want the car keys. Give me some money. If a parent wouldn't do that, why would God grant the request of a child who does not do that which is pleasing in his sight? Whatever you ask, he says, you'll get it, but you have to keep my commandments and do those things that are pleasing in my sight. And is there any place that God doesn't see us? There's no place that we can be hidden from God. Some people pray as though they're praying to a paper God. But look at Jeremiah 32:27. The reason why we need to believe when we pray to God and talk to him, 
This, this text is replete with the beauty of the kind of God we serve. He says, Behold, I am the, the Lord, the God of how much? All flesh. And let's read this together. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is what? Absolutely not. My wife and I began to pray 30 years ago. We were living in Orlando, Florida. We just got back from traveling to 19 countries with the Heritage Singers. And I sat at my desk in my office there. My wife and I worked at many companies together. We worked in New York together before we got married at the same company. We worked at two different companies after that. We traveled every day on the same bus. Every moment of every day, we were just inches from each other. How many husbands could handle that? Don't answer. But here we were sitting at the same company. She was the receptionist, and I was one of the accountants in the building, and she walked past my office, and, and I had a very discontent look on my face. And she said, John, what's wrong? I said, honey, I just got through traveling, Reggie, to 19 countries in two years, and all of a sudden I'm having to sit in the same place two days in a row. And I said, honey, she said, well, she, I said, there's got to be more to life than this. I want to be in the ministry. So we committed that to God. Amen. Commit your ways unto the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, if it is in harmony with his will. So we began to pray. We prayed, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed. And then the, prayer, the answers began to come. I received phone calls. Somebody said, we'd like you to go and be a pastor, start your ministry in Nebraska. And I prayed. I said, I'm from New York. I don't know anything about Nebraska. They tell me it's a cow town. I am not going to fit. So I turned it down after praying. Then I got a call to go to the Virgin Islands. Who wouldn't want a pastor in the Virgin Islands? Beautiful, clear water. But I prayed, and God said, that's not it. But I made the mistake. I said, Lord, we will go anywhere except California. Because <laughs> we just came back from California. Too far from family. What we did not know is sometimes God's got to take you from people that know you so that you can get to know him. We continued praying, and we saw friends in the mall, and one of them said, no matter what we do, we just cannot get in touch with you. And I want to say that was before cell phones existed, back in 19, yes, 86. I don't know if they had cell phones, but we didn't have one. So we bought an answering machine. Remember that? They used to stay in one place at one time. And so we bought the answering machine, put that answering machine in, went to work on Monday, and when we got back, the very first message on that phone was from the Northern California Conference president, a man we never met, did not know, had no clue about Northern California, 3,120 miles away from Central Florida. The message was, there's an opening in evangelism. Are you interested? Give us a call if you are. Nobody could have made that connection but God. But what preceded that is the most important thing. For one week straight, we prayed. We prayed like the Muslims pray with their face to the ground. We knelt on our bed. We only had one bed in our apartment and one recliner. We had no furniture in our apartment anywhere. God would not let us get furniture. They turned us down for a loan to get furniture. They said, you've traveled too many places to be stable. You don't have the kind of credit standing to get furniture. But God knows what we don't know. Come on, somebody. He knew that we didn't need furniture. So we prayed for one week straight, and we said our prayers changed. We said, God, we will go anywhere, including California. And that's where the phone call came from. That's where we began our ministry. Until we give God complete control of our lives, we will discover that there is nothing too hard for God. Amen. Pastor Doug Batch and I began in ministry in 1987. 1987, we began our pastoral ministry together in evangelism. And that's now going on X amount of years, 29 years later. God has opened the doors for us to continue giving him the glory. That's why Matthew 21, 22 says it this way. And whatever things you ask in prayer, what is the next condition? Believe. Believing you will receive. But let me even go a step further. We don't believe in what we're asking for. We believe in whom we're asking. It's all, it's all about Jesus. It's not about asking for money. Because you know what the Bible says? My God shall supply how much of your need? 
all of your need. But sometimes God, you might ask God for something. He knows you don't need it. Like I did. I asked my father when the Honda Accord first came out. Back in 1976, I was fresh out of high school. I just told you about my age. <laughs> fresh out of high school, and I, I was so enamored by this new Honda Accord, I said to my dad, I need a Honda Accord. He was from Barbados. <laughs> Me get a Honda Accord from a man from Barbados? What? <laughs> he was so tight when he sent me to the store. He'd give me a dollar, and he would... He would lick his finger to make sure two of them weren't stuck together. And I had the nerve to ask him to buy me a car, a brand new Honda Accord. You know what he said to me? You don't need a Honda. He said, furthermore, I don't like Japanese cars anyway. So I changed my tune. I want a, I want a, I want a, I want a deuce and a quarter, a Lecture 225. I need a Buick. He said, for what? I said, to drive you wherever you want to go. <laughs> it still didn't work. <laughs> And he said to me, you live in New York. You don't need a car in New York. But less than a year later, he called me downstairs to his room. And he said with that West Indian accent, Junior. I said, Papa. He said, here's a thousand dollars. Take it and put it down on whatever you want. Amen, somebody. Thousand dollars. I, I didn't disappoint him. I got a Japanese car. <laughs> and that car worked well for us that car had cancer when I bought it the fenders were rotten the tailpipe fell off the first time I took them for a drive but I'm going to tell you that car took my wife and I from New York to Florida from Florida all the way to California through the desert in the heat of the summer with no air conditioning brought us back that car served us until the day, until the day that it did not die <laughs> God can take a broken down life come on somebody and keep it together when he knows that you trust in his sufficiency and his ability to provide there's so many answers to prayer I could just tell I could just stop right here and just use the rest of the sermon and answer prayer we were in Northern California I got to add this one in here we are answered the call to go to Northern California Lord, I'm going to testify tonight about your goodness. We answered the call to go to Northern California, and they said, you got to get here how you can. Well, I want to tell you what that meant was, I told you we could not afford, they would not give us a loan, sister, to get furniture. The people in the furniture store said, you don't have enough stability to get furniture. You've been moving around too much. How are we going to get to California? We didn't have furniture either. And what we, what we discovered is that when we got the call to Northern California, the only thing that we could take was the bed we owned. We couldn't even take that $25 recliner that we bought at a used yard sale. That's why God did not want us to get furniture. But God in his mighty providence towards us, when we could not afford, when we couldn't get a loan for, for bedroom furniture, the Lord allowed us to get a loan for a brand new Toyota 4Runner. <laughs> now, you might think it's all about the car. It ain't about the car. Because after being in California for 11 months, Pastor Doug Bashler came to me and said, John, what are you going to do for the rest of the time? I said, well, you know, my wife and I have been praying. This evangelism is keeping me on the road too much. I'm praying that God could get us a church so that we could pastor together and work together. I don't want to be apart from my wife so much. He said to me, John... If you think that you're going to be in the ministry for less than a year without a degree and get a church in 11 months, you got another thing coming. I looked at my good friend Doug Batchelor and I said, God found you in a cave. <laughs> he and I always tell stories about each other. I hear him tell stories about us and we tell stories about him. Two weeks later, the conference secretary called me and said, we're going to give you a church up in the mountains of California. Yeah. Little tiny church. That's the church I told you about that was so empty I could shoot in this church and not hit anybody. We had two ages, very old, very young. Those who needed their diaper, well, I, don't, I want to be kind. Let me leave that alone. We had a very old and a very young church. When we got there, it was empty. When we left, it was packed. 
But to show you how God was working in answering prayers, our car, that Toyota I bought, couldn't really go any further. So somebody said, go ahead and get yourself a new car. The company we work for said, we'll go ahead and give you the money to get the car, the loan. And I said, okay. They said, our father said, he'll, the, the company owner said, we'll give you the loan. Whatever money you need to get that car, we'll give you the down payment. My wife and I took that by faith, went out, went and got ourselves a, a brand new Toyota 4Runner, put down a $2,500 deposit. We didn't have a penny, but the company said they will give us a down payment. We went ahead and did that. Went to work the very next day with our brand new car, excited about everything, and pulled up to the company, and the company's daughter, the company owner came out. Her daughter, his daughter said to us, you know, I talked to my dad last night. We're sorry. We can't give you the money right now. I got the car is sitting right there. So what do we do? My wife said, what do we do? I said, honey, we pray. We do what? Because we, we prayed two things. Lord, if you want us to have this vehicle, let the loan go through. So honey, let's pray. If we get the, if we get the call from Toyota that the loan went through, God wants us to have this vehicle. About an hour and a half later, the call came through. They said, the loan is approved. We're going to deposit the check. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, if they want to open a dealership on the moon, this will be a good time. <laughs> because that's about as high as that check is going to bounce. <laughs> but I said, she said, what do we do? I said, honey, let's pray. Let's do what? Pray. Let's pray. We prayed again. And I did something I had never done before. I made two phone calls, and in a matter of 10 minutes or less, the Lord provided $2,500 for that down payment. But let me tell you why that's significant. Don't get enamored by the car nor by the money. There's a, there's a reason behind that's much greater. That church that they gave us in the Northern California mountains, when we went to interview with that committee, when we sat before them, now 14 months later, long after we got this vehicle, the very first question they asked us was, do you have a four-wheel drive vehicle? <laughs> I don't know if you got that. This forerunner that we got in flat Florida, where you don't need a four-wheel drive vehicle, the first question this church up in the mountains of Northern California asked us, do you have a four-wheel drive vehicle? Without one, you'll never be able to visit the members. Prayer makes a difference. What do you say? Amen. So when we talk to God, James 1, verse 6 and 7 you got to be consistent in your prayers. Don't change your mind. If you can't make up your mind about your need, God cannot provide that need. The Bible says in James 1, verse 6 and 7, But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive what? Anything from the Lord. We prayed and God answered that prayer. We prayed and God opened the door. We prayed and God turned back every obstacle to bless his children. And I'm going to tell you tonight, my wife and I have made it through going on 30 years of pastoral ministry, through storms, through earthquakes, through attacks on our home and our marriage, through outside forces that would have crushed us had we not found the need to get on our knees and pray. I can give you so many more scriptures about prayer. But what I want to do tonight is something quite different. I want to give you an opportunity tonight to experience what it means to pray to the living God, the God who sits high but looks low, the God who knows absolutely no failure. I'm going to ask Tim to come to the piano. You know, when I was a young man, I believe one of the reasons why I am where I am today is because I was raised by a lady from Trinidad. I was abandoned by my parents at three months old left at babysitters, they never came back. My dad wasn't around, didn't know who he was until about 14 years later. I met my mother for the first time when I was almost 26. But here I was in the home, I got abandoned in the home of an Adventist Christian. Come on, somebody. God knew where I needed to be to get where I am today. When Friday evening came in, we sat at the piano. There I was barely able to even see, couldn't reach the ground. But she would sit us at the piano as the sun was setting. And she would play Sweet Hour Prayer. And when she played Sweet Hour Prayer, there was a connection made between me and God that has not broken ever since. 
when I was at the end of a gunpoint, not just once, but twice. I know that my mama's prayers when she passed away when I was 13 carried me through. When I almost got run over on a Friday night from drinking too much, partying when I know I shouldn't, I knew that was mama's prayers that kept me through that difficult moment. When I couldn't find answers to the difficulties of life, I turned and my wife said to me not too many years ago when I was working on my second CD and I wrote a song called Mama's Prayer. She said, don't use anybody else's song. What can you think about your mother that stands out in your mind? And I said, my mother prayed. She was a praying woman. And I wrote a song called Mama's Prayer. But I want to I have us just, I'm going to sing a little bit of this song tonight because I, I want to open the doors of the church tonight. Th this call has a multifacet to it. If you, if you feel the need tonight to turn your life over to the God who never fails, to the God who never knows, who never knows what it means to not have, to the God of all abundance, tonight as we sing this song, Sweet Our Prayer, you may be a person tonight that says, I want to come to God I want to open my heart to this God tonight. I want to pray. I want him to know the issues of my heart. I want to come before him and pray and bring those issues before the God that I need to connect with tonight as I sing this song, Sweet Hour Prayer. And you have a need tonight. And you want to know that that need will be supplied, that God will hear you, and God will answer that prayer. Tonight, wherever you may be, I just want to invite you to come up. I want to pray a special prayer tonight. If there's a need in your life that you have, if there's a burden that you want to lay down at the foot of the cross, if there's a God that you want to connect to that can bring you out of your darkness, out of your despair, and you're saying, Heavenly Father, I want to know that my prayers are not only heard, but that my heart is right with you tonight. I'm opening the doors of the church tonight. If you want to come down and pray with me, I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to that God who has never failed me. If you want to join me in that prayer tonight as I sing this song, just simply come from wherever you're sitting. We're going to sing the song, Sweet Hour Prayer. And you want to join with me, just sing it together. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour. 